Blake's. Like, hey, Scoob, did you hear Nikki Blake is hosting a Scooby-Doo panel? No. Yeah. Like on today's Scooby-Doo episode, Scooby-Doo and Shaggy meet Nikki Blake. Yeah, in a Scooby panel. <laughs> like, we need to get this puppy started. Yeah, okay. Nikki Blake, take it away, Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Welcome to the Scooby panel. I'm your host, Nikki Blake from ScoobyAddicts.com, and today we're going to be talking about Scooby Natural. Before we begin, I'll have everyone introduce themselves, and Wendy will start with you. Hi guys, I'm Wendy Bridge. I'm a commission artist. I've been collecting Scooby for over 30 years, and I am Team Dean because I love Supernatural. Not quite as much as I love Scooby, but we're getting close. Nice. Joel? Hey there, I'm Joel from the YouTube channel Planet Scooby. Awesome. So we're talking about Scooby Natural today, which in my opinion is the best crossover ever. They, I think that they did an amazing job with this and I'm going to just quickly read the overview of the episode. Scooby Natural is the 16th episode of season 13 of the series Supernatural. The 42-minute episode aired on The CW on March 29, 2018, and in the episode, the gang meet Sam, Dean, and Castiel from Supernatural, and they relive the episode, A Night of Fright is No Delight, which was the 16th episode of season one of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You?, and that aired on CBS on January 10, 1970. The episode starts off as a live action show with Sam and Dean stopping a killer stuffed dinosaur, which they refer to as Barney. In exchange for their effort, the shop owner gives them a television, which they end up getting pulled into and become part of a Scooby-Doo episode. They meet the gang at a malt shop and then head to the haunted mansion of Colonel Beauregard Sanders, where they have to spend the night in order for Scooby to inherit part of his fortune. The mansion is haunted by a phantom that is actually killing people, and the Winchesters have to figure out how to stop it with the help of the Scooby Gang. Throughout the process, the Scooby Gang find out ghosts are real, and they can't handle it. So after the phantom is captured and revealed to be the ghost of a little boy who was being controlled by a greedy real estate developer, the Winchesters and the ghost boy fool the gang into thinking the ghost really was a guy in a mask. The Scooby gang are happy again, and balance is restored. The ghost helps Sam, Dean, and Castiel get back to the real world, where they destroy the pocket knife that his soul was tied to, setting him free, and they have the criminal arrested for tax evasion. For the voice cast, well, cast in general, it was directed by Robert Singer, created by Eric Kripke. I'm sorry if I maybe said the name wrong. Written by Jim Krieg and Jeremy Adams. Scooby and Fred were voiced by Frank Walker. Shaggy was voiced by Matthew Lillard. Daphne voiced by Greg Delisle. Velma by Kate Micucci. Sam was voiced by Jared Padalecki, which fun fact, in an interview or a Comic-Con, he mentioned that he, went, he auditioned for the role of Shaggy in the live action movie, but he was beat by Matthew Lillard. Dean was voiced by Jensen Ackles and Castiel by Misha Collins. So let's get into our topics. The first topic is the references within the live action part. And we can also talk about the references within the episode itself. So did you guys notice all the mystery machines in the scenes of the, the live action scenes? I just noticed the one that was when he was signing the paper at the end, the shop owner, there was like a little ornament underneath the glass case. I think that's the only one that I noticed though. So there were a bunch of mystery machines in the background, which I didn't really pick up on right away. And then Mike was like, wait, what is that? <laughs> so he was the one that noticed it before me, which don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> So they show up a lot behind Sam and Dean, like after the dinosaur explodes. Uh, there was one near the door when Jay came in. 
And then there were at other points where they were talking, it was in the background. Um, when they went into the Dean cave, there was one on the shelf, but it wasn't there until he turned the TV on. After he turned the TV on, then they showed the shelf and the mystery machine was on the shelf. It was still on the shelf when Castiel went into the Dean cave. And of course, the episode was playing on the TV. And then it was on the shelf again when they went back to reality once they finished the mystery. And then Dean was wearing an ascot, which was great. I just think that was great. And there was a mystery machine at the end when they walked out of the shop. It was by the door. Like as they were walking out, you could see it by the door. When, and like you said, Wendy, when he was signing the papers, you could see the mystery machine in the glass case. The name on the police car was Crystal Cove Police. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. And then the greatest thing was when Dean said Scooby Dooby Doo at the end, <laughs> where they like went in on the circle around him so that he could say it yeah. like that. That was just awesome. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. So, what did you guys think of the? Um, the Scooby nods, basically, which was mainly the mystery machine, but the police being called a Crystal Cove police was cool, too. Joel? Yeah, I only noticed the uh, Crystal Cove police reference. I didn't even notice the mystery machines because I was reading your questions. I'm like, I don't see any Scooby references in the start. There's Barney and there's a <laughs> maybe a shady real estate guy, but that's all. Yeah, I picked up on. But now I have to go back and rewatch it a third time now. There was a point where they showed the door and on the, there was like a shelf to the right. And on that shelf, it looked like maybe there was a Scooby-Doo ornament, like in a, mm -hmm. like a Hallmark ornament in a box, but I wasn't sure definitely if that was a Scooby ornament. So I didn't mention it, but okay. it's possible. Okay. Wendy, what were your thoughts on them showing the, the Scooby nods? Firstly, do you think that the giant tiki head at the end when they're coming out of the shop was also like a little nod to Scooby? Mike had asked me that, and I'm not totally sure. It's possible that it is. Okay. Yeah. It, um, like, I definitely need to go back and rewatch this now for a third time. Uh, in two days because I need to see all of these mystery machines because I was watching thinking like surely they're going to put like some little easter eggs and things and um because in 15 seasons of Supernatural which I watched all of them there are quite a few Scooby-Doo like just random off-the-cuff references uh there's a really great one with Crowley where Dean says you know calls him Velma and they have a little argument and then he's like, oh, I'm actually really more of a Daphne. And it's very funny if you know the characters. Um, I'm glad that they didn't overdo it with the references. Like I really like, maybe there's some that got missed in what you mentioned, but I kind of doubt it. I'm, that, I'm pretty sure that you got all of them. And I do feel like you can kind of overdo that. And I, I don't think more was necessary because we had the actual Scooby world within the episode. So I like that there was stuff for people who were paying attention. You know, I kind of feel like maybe that's the main reason that they do things like that is just for overly observant viewers to like get a little thrill when they spot something because it is, it is a lot of fun when you see something and you're like, oh, that's, that's gotta be a nod to this, right? Um, but yeah, the, I don't know if I was surprised. I guess I shouldn't be surprised given like when this aired. I kind of, like, I'm not a big fan of Mystery Incorporated. So part of me is like, oh, that's cool that they used Crystal Cove. But the other part of me is like, yeah, but there was like way better Scooby series that they could have nodded to with like, even I, I honestly would have even preferred like maybe a pup named Scooby-Doo nod and it had said Coolsville on the cruiser. I don't know. That's that's just me. That's just my personal preference, though. I do appreciate that they that they did something, even if it was a nod to Mystery Inc. And like I say, given the time period, I guess it does make 
it does make more sense. Uh, and it was like a darker series and stuff, but it was just a lot of fun. And I definitely need to go back and spot every single one of those mystery machines because that's I'm going to think about that now, like the entire time that we're filming. <laughs> I I paused the TV several times and wrote down timestamps. So <laughs> if you need that, I can send it to you. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, when they met the gang and the dynamic between them all. So Sam and Dean first meet the gang at the malt shop where Dean immediately starts hitting on Daphne and being annoyed by Fred. He even makes a huge sandwich with Scooby and Shaggy and stretches his mouth super wide to eat it, which was really funny and, and really cool that he, he did that. I don't know. I it just, he, I felt like he, he spent a lot of time giving Daphne attention, but it was nice to see that he you know, gave that to Scooby and Shaggy at least for a little bit. Um, Dean called the Scooby gang his role models, but called Fred a wad. <laughs> he didn't like Fred because of his perfect hair, his can-do attitude, and his stupid ascot. <laughs> he continued to hit on Daphne, and it, she actually had some pretty good comebacks, and, and I thought that that was really funny. The thing that I really liked was that he was trying really hard to keep the gang from finding out that the ghost was real and the people were really dying. And I felt like he was like a parent trying to protect his kids. And it was just really endearing. Like, it was just so cool that he felt like that towards the gang. Sam wanted to tell the gang that the ghosts were real and people were really dead. And he at one point told Velma that, and Velma wasn't totally sure how to feel about it, but she kind of dismissed it. And then he, at one point, he tried to give her a gun. And Dean was like, you can't do that. That's a Scooby don't. <laughs> and then Sam finally came around and realized that the gang needed to think that it was fake. Of course, the way that the gang reacted, which we'll get into later, was, was funny. It was, it was funny. Uh, he... Oh, and, and he had a reference, he made a reference that Scooby-Doo was Marmaduke, which was also really funny. Like my jaw actually dropped the first time that I, <laughs> that I heard him say that because I'm just like, how could you? But <laughs> and then Castiel was surprised that Scooby could talk. Um, they had a really cool scene with him where Scooby jumps into Shaggy's arms and then Shaggy jumps into Castiel's arms. And I thought that that was really cool. So what did you think of the dynamic between the supernatural people and the Scooby gang? Wendy? Yeah, I think that honestly, the main reason that this special really worked is, and we will get into this more later as well, different points about it, but it really is just an episode of Supernatural and Scooby is in it. It's not a Scooby episode. It's not something that's totally a standalone kind of thing where if you know both of them, it doesn't really fit with either. Like, no, it is a Supernatural episode. And I love how Sam and Dean and Cass, they kept their same character. So if you know the show, it was to they they behaved exactly the way that you would expect them to behave they didn't change that although they did kind of like tone it down a little bit there's a couple times where dean's about to you know like swear or something and he stops himself because the scooby gang's around like you know they're a good influence on him um and so i love that they stayed true to the characters that they let the scooby characters stay true to themselves so when we see them interacting it's very believable because nobody seems like they're putting on something that they're not being genuine. And I appreciate that, you know, it wasn't just like 40 minutes of both Sam and Dean just completely fawning over the Scooby gang. You know, Dean obviously is a bigger fan and which is kind of the shtick of the show anyway, that, you know, Dean, Dean is more the leader. He's the older brother and, but he's also kind of the sillier one 
and it's kind of Sam sometimes it has to like rein him in a little bit so for Sam to be the one that's like come on settle down settle down dude it's fine and Dean is just you know with the sandwich there's actually if anyone is a fan of the show and of Scooby there's a really great video clip that you can look up on YouTube of Jensen Ackles doing like the be behind the scenes of him like doing the voice for that sandwich scene and it's hilarious it's so great and it's so clear that both of those actors were genuinely excited to do this like a Scooby crossover that they it wasn't just somebody you know WB came and said throw this in your show and they were like oh it's just it's just another cartoon you know and I think it definitely bled through in their performances that they really did you know not just Sam and Dean but Jensen and Jared also have like some kind of a love for Scooby and I think that made the whole thing extra special my favorite thing though about the dynamic of how they interact is to me and this might just be like a me thing but Freddie gets to shine in this special so hard and I feel like especially now Fred gets so much hate so much hate it's like they're constantly trying to like emasculate him and and make him into like something negative negative. and I think that how Dean you know he starts out he doesn't like Fred but in the end he comes around well why why doesn't he like Fred for the same reason that everybody else today doesn't like Fred they're jealous and you know what? You should be jealous of Fred. I'm a woman and I'm jealous of Fred. I aspire to be more like Freddie. Okay. And so like, it's unfortunate that people's jealousy of something that they feel is unattainable makes them project so much hate towards it. But that's why I love in this episode, you know, Dean keeps sticking it to Fred and Fred just keeps taking it. He's not a pushover. He's not, you know, he's not like a wet blanket or anything, but he just takes it all in stride. He's not rude. He doesn't snap back. He's just, he's Freddy. And we get to see why Daphne loves Fred and why we love Fred and why in the end, even Dean loves Fred. Fred throughout the whole thing runs into danger. He's, his bravery in this is just like, I, I don't know the way that they portrayed Fred in this is like my favorite thing of all and to see that progression of Dean being jealous and us being able to recognize that that's the problem he's jealous and then as he watches how Fred interacts with the gang and how Fred is interacting with him he comes around in the end and I feel like everyone is kind of better for it and so in a world where there is way too much hate for Fred, uh, go watch Scooby Natural and see how, you know, that's our classic Fred. That was such a genuine way. I don't know if they intended it to be something where the viewer was like, oh, Fred, I don't, maybe not. Maybe that's just me. And that's totally fine if that's just me. But I love it because Freddie is an aspirational character and I don't know, just to see Dean in that ascot at the end. I mean, that was that was just like the cherry on top. I don't even particularly think he looked that great in it. You know, I don't really think that it suited him. And I don't think that red is his color. But just the fact that now he wants to be Fred. I mean, that was just that was just such a huge win. And I I because I, I love Fred. I love Fred and I love Dean and I love how all of them just interacted together. Um, obviously. Sam and Velma, you know, um, I feel like we got our Johnny Bravo moment where I kind of would have like, you know, we, we talked in, in the special on that about how there's that little um, commercial special where like Johnny was, was into Velma, but she, you know, wasn't, she went off and did her own thing. And so I feel like this to see her, you know, get to give Sam a big smooch at the end and just totally take control of it and be like, yeah, yeah, I'm into you. And this is what's going to happen. And I don't know. I just I I like that for her and uh, chalk this up to just like time number three dozen where Velma has the hots for a guy and we'll leave it at that.
Joel, what did you think about the dynamic between the Scooby gang and the Winchesters? I don't have much more to add. Wendy is pretty thorough. Sorry. Um, no, that's great. I enjoyed listening to that. And you pointed out that great thing about Freddie too. Freddie's just so confident too. He just has no time for jealousy, right? Yeah. Uh, one thing I like too, um, Sam just pointing out everything that was illogical about Scooby-Doo, like the newspaper doesn't have words and there's better real estate scams than dressing up like a ghost and scaring people and staying in a haunted house for a million dollars is probably illegal. I don't know if it is or not, but I just like how Sam was kind of pointing everything out. But even by the end, he was just a big fan of Scooby-Doo as well, right? And and same with Cass. When he first met um, Shaggy and Scooby, he has to team up with him. He's, his one line was like, I've, I've led armies, but I'm now paired up with uh, Shaggy Philistine and uh, or Scruffy Philistine and a talking dog. And then at the end, he's just in love with Scooby and Shaggy. And I just love that dynamic, how they kind of turn the tables on they're kind of, you know, just kind of not liking the situation and then just loving the situation. Just, I like the the change in characterizations for that. And yeah, Dean, Dean was awesome. They did the same thing with him with like thinking Freddie's a wad and then just loving Freddie and wearing an ascot. Although he might've been wearing that ascot too because Daphne said she loved men in ascot. So he might've been wearing it for alternative motives too. But yeah, that, that was great. I did like the way that they split them up too, where it was Fred, Daphne, and Dean, and Velma and Sam, and Cass, Shaggy, and Scooby. I, I like that. I thought that was a great way to split them up. Mm -hmm. For sure. We're going to talk about the funny lines in the show. <laughs> so I have, I have quite a few that I really thought stood out. Uh, the one we, we already kind of touched on this, but um, where Dean says these guys, they're freaking role models, man, except Fred, he's a wad. And Sam says he's what? And Dean says, just think about it. We do the same thing. We go to spooky places. We solve mysteries. We fight ghosts. Sam says, yeah, except our ghosts don't wear masks and we don't have a talking dog. And Dean says, I don't know. Cass is kind of like a talking dog. <laughs> That was just way too funny. Uh. <laughs> and then when Dean wants Sam to play along with with uh, the Scooby style, right? Sam says, play. There are no words in this newspaper, Dean. We should be trying to get out of here. And instead, you're hanging out with Marmaduke. <laughs> and Dean gasps and says, how dare you? And like, I literally had that exact same response when I first saw that. I was like, oh, how could you? <laughs> After talking to Sam about not saying the C word, which was cartoon, Dean says, they're pure and innocent and good. We're going to keep it that way. I liked that they put that in there. And I, I, I just, I mean, we say it all the time that that's what they are and and it's true they are and they should stay that way yeah um let's see dean says so daphne an old drafty house would say we bunk together and daphne says oh dean boys and girls don't sleep in the same room silly <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just for her like little innocent comebacks they were just yeah, great yeah. Uh, there was the scene where Sam, I'm sorry, Dean shows up in the nightgown and Sam says, are you wearing a nightgown? And Dean says, it's called a sleeping robe. Between you and me, it's freaking comfortable. It's like I'm wrapped in hugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, when they find the guy that was stabbed. Sam says, Dean, this isn't a dummy. This is blood. He's dead. Like, like really actually dead. Velma says jinkies. Daphne says jeepers. Shaggy says zoinks. Scooby says rut row. Dean says, son of a bitch. <laughs> Sam says, so if that guy can die for real in this cartoon, that means we can too. And Dean says, it doesn't matter if we die. Scooby-Doo could die. And that's not happening, not on my watch. I'd take a bullet for that dog. 
<laughs> oh gosh. I <laughs> I think that was probably my favorite line of the entire thing. Yeah. But <laughs> Uh, Dean says, so Daph, I don't usually have to do this, but what do you look for in a guy? And Daphne says, oh, I don't know, strong, sincere, and an ascot wouldn't hurt. Like you said, Wendy, they, like Daphne, just so much love for Fred in this. Yeah. Even, yeah. even though they didn't necessarily make it romantic between them, yeah. it was just, it was really cool that, that there was so much love for her or for him. Um, and then the last thing I have is when Sam goes to hand Velma a gun and he says, here, Velma, take this. And Dean says, Sam, are you crazy? They can't use this stuff. That's a Scooby don't. Fred says, Dean, we've got to do something. I mean, you guys are amazing. Dean says, thank you, Fred. Fred says, but we can help. We have to. And Dean says, and it's bleep. Fucking right. You can. <laughs> You do what you do best. Build a trap. <laughs> yeah. I, for me, like those were the greatest, just the greatest dialogue moments in this. I, did you guys have a favorite interaction between the gang and, and the supernatural guys or just the gang or whatever? Joel? Yeah, there's not one line that's wasted in that episode. Everything's perfect. Uh, my favorite line or interaction would be Shaggy after breaking his arm. He's like, I jumped out of a biplane in a museum and I was fine. How did this happen? I just thought that was great because it references the first episode and like no one could even not break anything jumping out of a biplane in a museum, let alone Shaggy, but it happened. And I just thought it was so funny. It just I remember watching that the first time and it just blew my mind that they referenced like the first episode and, you know, you knew the writers did their research and were fans of the show to, to reference that very first episode. So that'd be my favorite line or interaction, but there's so many. Wendy. Yeah. I wrote down a couple other ones. I think my favorite, oh, it's really hard to choose, but I do think my favorite is um, Fred when they finally realize that, you know, all of these supernatural things are real. And Freddie says, we've been stopping real estate developers when we could have been hunting Dracula. Are you kidding me? My life is meaningless. <laughs> I loved, I thought that was really great. Um, close second, when they finally capture the ghost and then Sam and Dean let the gang back in the room Freddie says did you send it back to the fiery pit from whence it came and then Daphne pops out and she says kill it with fire again just so I mean it's so special that it's the Scooby gang saying it too because there's so much innocence behind it like how do you not love it it's just like they they nailed it so great about how you know, classic Scooby would have probably reacted to this situation. You know, I thought it was quite authentic. I thought they did a really great job. Uh, of course, the uh, that that's a Scooby don't with the guns is uh, another great line. Uh, another funny one right after the chase scene. Uh, a couple people are talking, and it's uh, you know we have to stop this ghost. Well, we almost did. Dean had him by the thigh. He what? I almost caught him. That's the point. <laughs> Which that is just like a classic supernatural moment. If you know the show, that is such supernatural humor that just uh, the way that they blended it all together between the two properties was just like magnificent. They did such a great job. But yeah, like Joel said, like every, like there was nothing was wasted. There wasn't a wasted moment. There wasn't a wasted word. Everything was just so beautifully crafted that like, what criticism could we even have? Like all the lines are the best line. Yeah, the writing for this episode was amazing for sure. Um, some of the other things that they did within the episode that were nods to Scooby were the glowing eyes. That mm -hmm. was in the dark, that was pretty cool. Uh, them hiding in a vase. Mm -hmm. And of course, Fred builds an elaborate trap and then it doesn't work, <laughs> so. <laughs> And Scooby and Shaggy being bait. Yeah. That always happens. Let's talk about the chase scene. 
Uh, so they played the Scooby-Doo Where Are You theme song, which was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And who did we see run by very quickly? Scrappy. I thought I had one handy that I could whip out, but I don't. (laughs) (laughs) You just see him just run from one door to the other and that's it. So, I mean, they kind of brought him back, right? Yeah. He was running, which is good. You didn't (laughs) have to hear him. You just saw him. Uh, I thought that the chase scene was, it, it was, it was cool because it was, you know, them running through the doors and then they, they nail the doors shut. Uh, the ghost still gets through because it can go through doors. And I liked that it wasn't drawn out. It didn't take away from the episode. It was like the perfect length and, you know, it fit in the episode really well, but it didn't take away from the story at all. Wendy, what were your thoughts on the chase scene? Well, of course, uh, first watch on this when it came out, Scrappy was like the first thing that I noticed and I was very excited. Um, I I kind of would have liked to have seen like Scrappy interacting with Castiel. I feel like that would have been an interesting pairing. I don't know why, but I mean, I'm I'm appreciative that they included Scrappy and it wasn't something negative. Like he just he just runs by. That's all. He's just there. It's just like a nod, like, yeah, this character exists and it's not that bad, you know? So I definitely appreciated that. And little Scrappy looked really good too. I mean, he did look a little angry. His fists were like, up. He have to be, but you know, I get it. I get it. It is Scrappy. Uh, and love that they played the original theme. Uh just Again, it just kind of, the whole thing kind of felt like a big love letter to Scooby in a way without it coming across as like too fanny, you know, Mm -hmm. like they, they crafted a really great story. They did a great job, um, taking an original Scooby story and making it something brand new, you know? And so I did like the pots where they get in the pots and stuff because that is pretty, pretty classic Scooby, but I think you're right. It, it really worked because they didn't overdo it. It wasn't four minutes long. Now we got away with four minutes in Johnny Bravo because that awesome song. Right. But in this one, we had just the theme song. So I'm glad that they kept it like short and sweet. We got the point. We got the little references and, and everybody was happy and then it was over and we moved on. So I, but, but yes, Scrappy, you show me Scrappy. I mean, what else is there to talk about? I love Scrappy. (laughs) Joel, what were your thoughts on the cheese scene? Yeah, uh, not much more to add. I like the shortness. I like the longness of Johnny Bravo as well, but I like the shortness of this one. And I like how there's also stakes at hand, like, um, the gang were trying to protect, or not the gang, the Sam and Dean were trying to protect the gang from being hurt by the ghost because the ghost could hurt them in real life or cartoon life or Mm -hmm. that, whatever life that is. And I like that they incorporated that and some comedy in there. Scrappy, even though Scrappy's in there only for a couple of seconds because it's so short, I think everyone probably noticed him like first time watching because sometimes with those chase scenes, you just kind of like, blank out but this was just the perfect length where you could just kind of take everything in notice everything that was going on and yeah i think that's all i got to say about the chasing it was just perfect yeah definitely perfect let's talk about how they got away with the gruesome stuff in the episode every time i watch this episode i'm just like how do they keep like putting this in here and then i'm like wait this is not a scooby-doo episode this is a supernatural episode. There's a big difference. So they they toned down supernatural really in order to be able to make a Scooby Doo episode. And it's I literally like have to say this to myself every time I watch it. It is a supernatural episode. We see the guy with the knife sticking out of his back in a pool of blood. They show the guy hanging from the ceiling, but his head and his lower body are on the floor in a pool of blood. You have the the phantom who has a huge knife. 
it's different for a Scooby episode. But again, the way that they did it was just so good. Just, it's like perfect writing. I, I don't know. I don't know. It was, it was just so good. Joel, what are your thoughts on all the gruesome stuff in the episode? Yeah, it was gruesome. And even at one point, Dean like turns on, almost pukes in his hand. Uh, like some of that stuff was right out of Hellraiser, you know, like that was, it's all animated, of course. But also I think they got away with it too, because the gang are innocent and pure. So they look at it, they just see like a dummy filled with corn syrup with food coloring, right? It's like a Halloween prop to them until later on they figure out it was real. But I think that's another way they got around with it. Like some of the stuff you could see if you go out on Halloween with the way people decorate their houses nowadays with uh, gruesomeness. So I think the gang, they're just like, oh yeah, we've seen that trick-or-treating before kind of deal. Or we've seen stuff not as gruesome, but we we know it's just like smoke and mirrors kind of deal. And like you said too, it's a it's a supernatural episode as well. So not it's not exactly Scooby Doo. That's yeah, that's all I gotta say. Wendy. Well, I apologize because I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> um I do and uh I thought about it so much that I hope I don't just jumble up all of my thoughts I do have quite a few notes but I don't just want to read them um but I think the main apart from the fact that like you both said it's a supernatural episode this is not an episode of Scooby-Doo this is an episode of Supernatural that Scooby-Doo is appearing in apart from that the key word here I think is context what is the context of the violence and the gruesomeness and who is involved? And this makes a huge difference. Uh, I think the timing of this is great because the first season of Velma just ended. And I have seen a lot of people kind of being like, well, why was it okay in, in Scooby Natural, but you don't think it's okay in Velma? And again, what are what is the context here so we've already done this quote but i'm going to do it again because i think it is the backbone of all of this dean says they are pure and innocent and good and we're going to keep it that way and they spend the entire episode trying to shield the scooby gang from all of this real horror not just because they think they can't take it but because they have respect for those characters and who and what they are and what they stand for. In something like Velma, because I think even if you haven't seen any of the episodes, there have been enough trailers and videos and reactions and comments and articles to get a pretty good gist of some of the things that are going on. Um, in Scooby Natural, the Scooby gang is not participating in the violence and the gore they are another thing that i thought made this whole episode work is that scooby and the gang are almost like they're in the background if you think about that when you watch it it becomes so readily apparent that this is just a hundred percent supernatural and scooby's in the background You'd think that because we see so much of them that they would play more of a, of a role in this. But honestly, if you think about it, I don't really feel like the Scooby gang is actually integral to the mystery and the case that Sam and Dean are working. They just happen to be there. And Sam and Dean are the ones that are interacting with them. In a show like Velma, where there is a lot of also the same type, I mean, we get like somebody with their head cut off pretty easy comparison because it's like exactly the same thing no head no head um in a show like that number one it's about those characters people can say that that is not a scooby-doo show but i'm sorry you are using the scooby characters it's a scooby-doo show no matter how you you can't get away from that i'm sorry but you can't in something like that those characters themselves are active participants in the debauchery and the gruesomeness and the violence. They are participating in it. In Scooby Natural, the Scooby gang is not participating in any of it. 
They are completely, you know, they're around it, but they are still somehow completely removed from it. Even when they get affected by it, like Shaggy breaks his arm, you know, Freddy gets a bloody nose when he gets thrown up against the wall. It's still not made, like, it's not the focus. It's just, it's happening. And so I think when you're looking at things like that, like what's appropriate and what's not and how come it works here, but it doesn't work there, the context of it means everything. And we don't see the Scooby gang being something that they're not in Scooby Natural. They are 100% their authentic selves. And it's just that bad things are happening around them. And people might not think that that's enough to make a difference. But it is. It is because another point that I think we could make is if anyone has watched Supernatural, I mean, 15 seasons, there's a lot of episodes. It was a very long show. But at its core from day one, Supernatural really is Scooby-Doo for grownups. Like that's a trope that they have throughout and they make jokes about it. But it's true. It's not you know that that's very true and when dean says that you know these are our role models if you watch the entire series and you learn about the character of sam and dean themselves it they they totally it's totally believable that they could have been real people who watched scooby-doo and then were influenced by these characters and how they behaved not just that they solve mysteries but like what is the internal character of those characters and how can we adapt some of that in our own lives, which we have talked before on the panel, Life Lessons of Scooby-Doo. There are tons of things that we can learn from classic Scooby and the gang that are very much applicable in our everyday lives. It's not just a cartoon. You know, a lot of thought and care went into cultivating something that children were going to watch and that hopefully adults would also be able to enjoy and continue to watch. And there are things for us to learn good lessons for us to learn and so supernatural and scooby at the end of the day there might be bad things but it's still a story of classic good versus evil and no matter what good wins in the end from day one on supernatural until the end of season 15 that also was applicable in their show which is why I think that the two paired together meshed so seamlessly because they are in essence the same thing. They really, really are. Sam and Dean are the Scooby gang. They have saved the world countless times. They don't get any thanks for it. They don't get any recognition. They just do it because it's the right thing to do and they wanna help people. That's the Scooby gang. That is, that is their credo, their motto. That is, that's everything that, that makes them who they are. And Sam and Dean do exactly the same thing. So we're not getting gruesomeness and violence for no reason. You know, it's not just in there for like the shock value of it. You know, it makes sense in the story. And I don't want to jump ahead to the next question. Like it affects them the way that, you know, obviously something like that would affect you in real life, but we also don't have to dwell on it, you know? And so I just think that who's doing the things, how they're reacting to it, it makes a huge difference. You need the context because there is no comparison. Okay, I will argue this until the hounds come home. There's no comparison between Scooby Natural and something like Velma. It is completely different. And that is not just my Scooby bias talking or anything like that. You watch the Scooby characters in each show and you tell me that that's the same thing because it's not. It's not. And for them to try so hard to make sure that people could watch this and not be turned off because of things like something gruesome, I think is a huge testament to the people that wrote and acted in Scooby Natural. Uh, not anybody, not, not just anybody could have written this and made it successful. 
Um, so huge props to the people that obviously knew Scooby, respected him enough not to drag him into the mud and just make him another casualty of our modern world, you know, because that could have really easily happened and it didn't. I, I watch this and I don't have any problem with it because I, I'm still just seeing my Scooby gang doing what they do in exactly the same way that they've always done it. It's just that now they're also being exposed to things that we know are also, I mean, not everybody believes in supernatural things. I do. Um, maybe not quite exactly the same way that they are in that show, but there is evil, you know, there is more than just like the evil real estate developer trying to steal land and stuff like that. But no context matters. And, uh, yeah, there's no comparison. If you want to make that comparison between those two things, you are not going to win that argument. You're just not. Let's move on to the gang's almost breakdown in the episode. So they held it together for part of the episode and then the phantom started messing with them. So Fred got thrown across the room and got a bloody nose and Shaggy was thrown out the window, eventually fell to the ground and broke his arm. And like you said, he had referenced what a night for a night, which was really cool that they referenced that. Then they convinced them, they convinced the gang that monsters were real. Well, that was not a good idea because <laughs> the gang lost it. They were a mess. Wendy, you brought up that Fred said, we've been stopping real estate developers when we could have been hunting Dracula. Are you kidding me? My life is meaningless. And he bangs his head on a tree. Daphne says, if there are ghosts, that means there's an afterlife. Heaven? Hell? Am I going to hell? Shaggy says, we told you every freaking time. But did you ever listen to Scoob and me? No. And Scooby says, we're doomed. Dean, being the voice of reason, does this whole speech to get them to turn their attitudes around. And he uses a lot of Scooby references, which is great. So Dean says, all right, knock it off. Come on, the Scooby gang does not have nervous breakdowns. You may not have tangled with the supernatural, but you fought monsters, real freaking psychos. You stopped Zeke and Zam. Shaggy figured out that the shark's old Iron Face Road were really just torpedoes disguised to look like sharks. And what about the Black Knight, huh? Mamba Wamba? Sam says, the space coop. And Dean says, I knew it. You love this show too. Sam shrugs and says, mm. Dean says, space coop, ghost clown, minor 49er. You guys have all jumped into danger with no thought of yourselves. You're heroes. And together, we're going to take down this phantom. Are you with me? The gang says, yeah. Fred says, let's do it. So his pep talk helped to kind of pull the gang back together. And then, of course, once they get the Phantom and Sam and Dean come out, Fred says, should I, should I make another trap? Velma says, I could get the shotgun. Daphne says, I could get two shotguns. Shaggy says, like, tell Scoob and me when it's over. And Scoob says, yeah, and whimpers and shakes. <laughs> then they take them in the room. They unmask them. They let them know that they were right. It was just the real estate developer in disguise. They unmasked him. They said that it was wires, projectors, and dummies filled with corn syrup. The gang we're back to their normal selves, no longer having a breakdown. Dean hits on Daphne. Velma, Velma kisses Sam. Cass thanks Scooby and Shaggy for helping him learn to laugh in the face of danger. And the gang walk away happy. And everything is restored to the way it should be in the Scoobyverse. So, what are your thoughts on the gang's almost breakdown? Joel? I, yeah, when I first saw that episode, I just love that breakdown. Even, even though, you know, they were suffering a bit, uh, just, just 
Daphne going, wondering if she's going to hell, just cracked me up. And then part of me just would want to see what Freddie does with Dracula. Would like, what would happen in that situation? I'd love to see that. But of course, we wouldn't have the pure and innocent Scooby Doo if if that did happen. But you know, you just want to think what would what would an episode of Scooby Doo be like if Fred and the gang went to Transylvania? But yeah, I'm. Despite all that, I'm glad they re reset everything, put the gang back to normal, sent them off on their way for their next adventures, and because it is a, a supernatural episode, not a Scooby Doo episode, so I'm glad they did that. But just I did not expect them to even go into that kind of breakdown situation at all so it was a big surprise and yeah i just i just loved it that's all i got wendy what are your thoughts on the gang's breakdown yeah i do think it was necessary because the reset at the end was going to be necessary in order to like again just another way of paying respect to the characters that you're essentially like using for a time, but they don't belong to you. So give them back the way that you found them. Use them in the meantime, but put them back the way that you found them. Don't, don't damage them. So I love that they had enough respect for the Scooby gang to, uh, to do that. And I think a breakdown was really the only way that they could integrate those characters into the the real world horrors of the supernatural um but then also have a reason and an ability to get them back out of it if they had just accepted it how are you going to take them back out of it now you know like they kind of had to freak out in order to be able to do, do the reset at the end um i think the best part of that scene though is that it's just a momentary thing they freak out in the moment, but then Dean reminds them of who they are and what they do and that it's okay. And immediately the Scooby gang bounces back and they are ready to like get in there and get the job done the way that the Scooby gang does. Because like I said before, both the Scooby gang and Sam and Dean, their whole thing is they see something, people are in trouble. They sacrifice of themselves to help. That's, that's just who these people are, all of them. It doesn't matter that they're characters on TV. It's their internal character, you know? So I'm glad that they kept it short. It made it, they made it funny. You know what I mean? It, it, there was a little bit of humor in it, which again is another big comparison between Supernatural and Scooby-Doo just in general. It's the same type of humor. The characters are not deliberately trying to say something funny or be funny. It's incidental humor, and it's very, very humorous. Totally see that throughout all of Supernatural. And so the gang's breakdown, like, they made it, like, obviously it's not a good thing that's happening, and you feel kind of bad for them, but they wrote it and they acted it in such a way that there's a lot of humor in it. So we can kind of, like, we have our little fun, and then we move on from it. And I think that was the important thing, is, like, the moving on part. And sure... Again, they kind of like start relapsing a little bit with, you know, da I love, honestly love Daphne. I'll get two shotguns. You know, that was just made me picture Daphne with like shotguns strapped to her back. I have to admit, I, I don't hate that visual. I would kind of like to see that. Um, but yeah, reminding them of who they are, seeing them overcome their fear and their shock just another great lesson for people watching. I mean, I'm sorry if you don't want to watch stuff and get a lesson from it. And maybe the writers don't intend it. I don't care. I don't care. If you look for something positive and you find something positive, that's a good thing. Okay. There's too much negativity. So if you can see something positive like that in a show, whether it was intentional or not is irrelevant. Make it relevant to you. And so I loved that because, again, we just got to see our heroes, and they are heroes. The Scooby gang are heroes in their own way, the way that Sam and Dean are heroes in their own way. And to see them all come together and work together for the greater good of someone or something, like, it's just magical. It was just great. So I think it had its place in that episode, and it was totally necessary for them to be able to then backtrack and be like, no, it's 
it's just a dummy with some corn syrup. It's just some pulleys. It's totally fine. Like your arms probably, well, Castiel heals Shaggy's arm, you know, cause he's an angel. So he can do that. Uh, and everything is back to normal and, and we all, you know, no harm, no foul kind of thing. And, and so I think it really worked that they, again, just like aces writing, perfect writing for that. Couldn't have written it any better. I'm still going with this was the best crossover ever. And I don't know if they'll ever beat it. It was, it was the perfect mix of adult humor, adult, you know, content, but they didn't take it too far. They kept the integrity of the characters intact, which was important. It was written well, it was funny, it was scary but they respected the characters. It's definitely as adult as I would ever want Scooby to be. I would love to see a series of Scooby Natural. And at a Comic-Con or something, Jensen Ackles said that the show did so well that there were talks that they were going to do more. But I have no idea if that will ever come to be, but that would be amazing if it did. Joel, do you have any final thoughts on Scooby Natural? Yeah, just like what you said, we'd love to see a series or even a movie if they keep up the quality, of course. And yeah, it, it worked for me too because they just, like I'm old and I haven't really loved Scooby-Doo like since the Scooby-Doo show, like everything after has had diminishing returns in a lot of cases, not everything, but Johnny Bravo is great because they kept the gang as the gang and this was great because they kept the gang as the gang like sure you can switch up their ethnicities or whatever i don't care but when you mess with their personalities it just does not work for me those are my final words before i ramble on wendy your final thoughts on scooby natural yeah just the only thing that we haven't talked about which is another of my favorite things about this guys the hanna-barbera worthy background art in scooby mm -hmm. natural my oh, yeah. goodness, my goodness, go back and watch that episode. If you would even mute it and do nothing but pay attention to all of the beautiful background art because it is stunning. It looks like classic animation, even though it's probably digital, but it looks like classic animation. Beautiful, beautiful. The out, the, the exterior of the haunted mansion it's incredible all i could think about like on my second rewatch it, i it was distracting me in the first one and i'm like no i need to pay attention to the dialogue but the second time i was able to just like watch a lot more and there there is no ugly or minimalist background in like the 44 minutes that this episode is they went all out they went all in on this. There was so much love for Scooby and classic Scooby. And I think that Hanna-Barbera would have been proud to see this. And definitely, probably, I mean, I okay, I'm going to say it. Since probably the Scooby-Doo show, I'm even going to exclude 13 Ghosts. I don't think I've seen background art in scooby that was like this magnificent because i think where are you has the best background art out of any scooby series or honestly any Hanna barbera series i would even go that far to say and uh scooby natural it it is on par with scooby doo where are you as far as the background art goes another quick shout out to the animators that were doing the facial expressions at first when I watched it, and this goes back to when I first saw it air, when it was like first airing, and then my re my first rewatch yesterday, initially I was like, oh, does it really look like Sam and Dean though? Like, does it really look like Jensen and Jared? But once I started paying attention to the actual facial movement and the expressions, I don't know that I've ever seen more expressive animated character faces in my life and they because obviously I was a huge supernatural fan like when this aired 
I watched it because it was the next new episode of Supernatural. I wasn't even watching it for Scooby. It was just the next episode. If you know Sam and Dean for years, you know their facial expressions, you know their tics, you know, you just know their faces. Man, whoever animated those two characters in this special, holy crap, you guys did an amazing job. They they nailed it and once i saw the expressions and i recognized them it totally my initial thought that they maybe didn't look quite right was wrong it totally looked like them you could tell like if you can tell from an animated expression expression meaning like how the eyes like not just how it looks but like what the face is doing i've never seen better facial animation on anything they they captured those two characters to perfection so even just like as an artist these are the kind of things that I like when I watch animation I like to watch for this stuff and see how well people do um 10 out of 10 100 out of 100 a thousand out of 100 like knocked it out of the ballpark go and watch it if you even if you are not like a fan of Supernatural go and watch it just for like the artwork in this because it is exceptional the artwork the backgrounds the writing the whole thing is just amazing they really took the time to do both supernatural and scooby-doo justice and they combined them so well another thing i was watching yesterday was some behind the scenes of them actually recording Mm -hmm. which is really funny and I'll put the link in the, the description of the video because you should check it out. It's it's funny. And just their dynamic, Jared Padalecki, Misha Collins, and Jensen Ackles, their dynamic together is just amazing. It's fun. And yeah, you just check it out. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to wrap things up before we do. Let everyone know where they can find you on social media. And Wendy, we'll start with you. On Instagram, I'm at Wendy Bridge. Uh, Twitter, I'm Wendy Loves Jesus. And my blog is wendylovesjesus.wordpress.com. Joel? You can find me on YouTube. Just search for Planet Scooby. And you can find all my links on scoobyaddicts.com. Thank you for joining us for another Scooby panel. Thank you for tuning in to another Scooby panel. I'm Nikki Blake from scoobyaddicts.com. If you like these panels, please subscribe to my channel for more great discussions. A huge shout out to our patrons, Julie Rosen, Ross from ScoobyFan.net, Scooby-Doo of Roblox, Ruth Elliott Hillsden, and Tej. If you would like to support the Scooby panel, please go to patreon.com slash scoobyaddicts. A very special thank you to Joel from Planet Scooby, and artist, blogger, and Scooby collector, Wendy Bridge. Scooby Panel is available in podcast form on most podcast platforms or as a web series on YouTube. You can find Scooby Panel on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as at Scooby Panel. Scooby and Shaggy were voiced by Scott Ennis. Check out Scott's website, onescottshop.com. Scooby Addicts artwork by Will Davenport. Video editing by Nikki Blake. Music composed and performed by Bovine Nightmares. Please join us next time for another Scooby panel.